Hey, and welcome, Wyandotte United Methodist Church. I am really loud this morning. Wow. Well, if you weren't awake, you are now. <laughs> I am so excited to be here this morning with you. First, it is our Sunday or so after Pentecost, and we have been greeted with the Spirit, and we know who we are. We are faithful people, and we are walking in the Spirit, are we not? Yeah. Amen. And I know where I'm going, and I can tell you that I am, have been appointed to Garden City United Methodist Church. Thank you. You have launched me into ministry. Thank you. Thank you. And it is exciting to know that you are sending me out into my first appointment. I cannot thank you enough for the opportunity to have spent these last several months serving you as pulpit ministry and a little bit more. And now I'll be going to serve them full time as their pastor. And I could not have had a better opportunity to have gotten my toes wet and a little bit more. Um, and it, it has been my pleasure to have been here with you, and I'm still here. So, having said that, having said that, I'm gonna let my friend here, Don, start us off, please. Good morning. Our mission of the month for June is Healthy Women, Healthy Liberia. This is an organization which provides health care for families in Liberia, Africa. It was started by this Dr. Chris Henna and was originally located in a tent in her yard some years ago. Since then, the Waterford Medical Center has grown to be a full-service clinic, now including a maternity and surgical wing, which opened this year. Healthy Women, Healthy Liberia is doing everything it can to ensure that the people of Katara, Liberia stay healthy, babies are delivered safely, children are vaccinated. Mothers learn about nutrition and sanitation, and the sick receive the care that they need. The missing piece of this puzzle is the lack of a dentist and regular dental care for the citizens of that community. You can support this vital work with second mile giving by using your mission fund envelope and time during the month of June to support healthy women, healthy Liberia. And now we'll see a short video about the needs and the work of this mission. population of over 200,000 and in this country there is no dentist at the Waterfield Primary Health Care Center in Liberia, West Africa, Mike County. There are a lot of services that we render includes, including ultrasound, laboratory testing, eye care, pharmacy, free needle care, and even the canteen. But what we lack now is our dental care. The only place we have a dental clinic is in Monrovia, which is a couple hours away, and also in Niva County, another couple hours away from Mark Gibby. The department is here 
but we do not have a dentist and so there's a need for a dentist and there are need for supplies in the dental in the dental care and also compensation for our dentist at the initial stage for about six months to a year we also need installation of our equipment that was brought by Project Q and all other things that will make this dental department to be equipped and functional in this our facility. We also need outreach that will include gasoline, transportation that will enable us to reach our people with dental problems in the 36 communities in Kakata. We at Waterfield we all join to say a very big thank you. So remember this mission in your June mission envelopes. Thank you. Well, we all know it's graduation season, and we are honoring all of our 2023 graduates on June 11th at 10 a.m. in our single service, and we would like to have all of our graduates present for this service if, if possible. So please come. Also, it's Music Sunday next week. Next week. I'm so excited. So, this is a three-parter. Next week, A, graduates. B, Music Sunday. C, cookie reception. <laughs> cookie reception. And cookies are still needed, people. Get baking. You can sign up as a cookie volunteer board. I signed up. I signed up. I'm bringing cookies. Theo and I are going to be baking because we want to show off our cookie baking skills. And last but not least, this is the start of our summer worship schedule. I know we put it out there that we we're going to start in July, but we changed our minds because we said, why, why confuse everybody and have start in July when we're going to have one service in June. So we're doing it in June. So next week, 10 o'clock, be here or be square and bring your cookies and your graduates. All right. Having said that, please watch our intro video. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. What is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You have made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Oasis service. If you'd please stand and join us in worshiping God.
Heavenly Father, we come before you today as a congregation thankful for this day, thankful for the blessings that you have provided us that we don't always see. We know that you are far and above beyond anything that we can imagine, but you have made yourself known to us so personally that we can have a personal relationship with you just like we have with one another. And although before you no secrets are hid, every heart is open and all thoughts are known, there is safety in this relationship like there is with no other person. Your omniscience, your power is always used for our benefit. And we thank you, Lord, and we pray that you grace us deeply with your presence this morning and this day and this week as we carry on. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated as we continue to worship.
stand and join in singing our doxology? Praise and glory to the Father. Praise and glory to the Son. Praise and glory to the Spirit. Ever three and ever one. Praise and glory to the Father. Praise and creation we offer our gifts and gratitude this morning not just for what you do in our lives but for who you are in our lives you are our sovereign God above us all we greet you through the Son the divine as God beside us you empower us to do the work of the kingdom the Holy Spirit God within us, providing strength and boldness that we would never find on our own. May the gifts we provide become tools to transform the world. We pray in the name of the one God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm back, and you know what that means. That means that we're going to read the scriptures responsively. It's my favorite way to do it. I have to read it all because I'm on the microphone, but I invite everyone to, to read the emboldened lines so that we're all reading scripture together. We'll begin with Genesis uh, chapter 1, verses 27, through Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was, every, and there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. The seventh day, God rests. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. All right, and second scripture reading is Psalm 8. Uh, it's a beautiful psalm. Um, you should just be reading it daily. It's just, it's, it's an amazing psalm um, about really the Messiah. If you, if you ever wonder where Jesus is in the Old Testament, read the psalms. He is in all of the psalms. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes. 
to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? You have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with the glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the seas, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. All right, straight into it. Very good. I went to the wrong spot. There we go. <laughs> All right, so uh, the Christian celebration of Pentecost was last week. I missed my chance. I really like talking about Pentecost and the Holy Spirit, so I decided I'd do it anyways. But I'm still mixing in, of course, the Trinity because this is Trinity Sunday. But what better way to talk about Trinity than to dwell upon the Holy Spirit and Pentecost, right? So lots of Christians know about Pentecost from the book of Acts. We know that Jesus' disciples were in the upper room um, and, and a sound like a, and, and a, a whirlwind, a sound like a mighty wind and what appeared to be tongues of fire appeared and God the Holy Spirit filled the disciples. What might not be as readily apparent is that the disciples were in the upper room to celebrate Pentecost. We celebrate Pentecost as Christians because, well, it's when the Holy Spirit came and, and indwelt men. Um, and, and the church really took off with the empowering of the Holy Spirit. But the, the Israelites celebrated Pentecost for hundreds of years before that um, because it was a feast day that God had instituted in the book of Leviticus. And there were detailed instructions for the celebration of Pentecost, also known as the Feast of Latter First Fruits. But the punchline here is that Pentecost was set in time 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits. So the Feast of First Fruits, and then Pentecost, which literally in the Greek means 50th. So 50 days later is Pentecost, the Feast of Latter First Fruits. Now the Feast of First Fruits, there was one. It, it was the first harvest of barley. One sheaf of grain was to be put out in the field, and it was supposed to be put there overnight, and then it was to be cut and prepared, and on the third day it was to be offered to the Lord. You can see where the symbology here, that, was, that first fruit, that first harvest, was Jesus the Christ. Jesus Christ rose from the dead on the day of first fruits as the first of the kingdom, the first of the resurrection. And 50 days later, on the Feast of Latter First Fruits, the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes and indwells people. The feast itself had been the first harvest of wheat presented to the Lord for offering. So, different type of first. If it wasn't Trinity Sunday, I would take the whole sermon to go over the Feast of Israel, actually. There's a lot of imagery um, that clearly God was thinking about this when he instituted the festivals. And we can see, well, these are the ones that have been completed, and these are the festivals that haven't yet been completed. So we can see what, you know, what God's plan is still. We can, we can track where we are in redemptive history by looking at how many of the feasts have been fulfilled in the Gospels. Well, one scholar writing on Christian theology says that we live in an age where the most prominent work of the Lord is now through the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, God the Father was most prominent in his works. He made the heavens and the earth, and he interacted with his people, his chosen people, through many books of the Old Testament. And then through the Gospels um, and up through the Ascension, 
God the Son is the most prominent worker. But then he ascends into heaven, and now we're in the age of the church where God the Holy Spirit is the most prominent worker of the Trinity. But what are the prominent works of God the Holy Spirit? That's what I would like to talk about today, and I submit that any Christian who dwells on the works of the Holy Spirit will be drawn closer to God. God says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. So just, uh, but before that, before that, what do we know about God the Holy Spirit? What does Scripture say? Scripture tells us that God the Holy Spirit is a person. You shouldn't be confused and, and think of spiritualness, spiritual-ish, no Eastern mysticism. God the Holy Spirit is a person. Jesus refers to the Spirit with a masculine pronoun, not, not the neuter, not an it. The apostle and elders at Jerusalem sent a letter to the church at Antioch expressing the sentiment, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. So an opinion requires personality. And John 14 tells us that the Spirit teaches. 1 Corinthians 12, that he distributes spiritual gifts as he wills. The Ephesians 4.30 tells us that the Spirit can be grieved. So intelligence, will, and emotions are the three fundamental elements of personhood. We are all intelligent, willful, and containing emotions. God the Holy Spirit is that same way, like any person. But the Holy Spirit is divine. The Holy Spirit knows the thoughts of God. The Holy Spirit has the trait of omniscience, just like God the Father. Peter uses the words Holy Spirit and God interchangeably in 1 Corinthians. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in your midst? So the Holy Spirit possesses divine attributes like omniscience and eternality. No one knows the thoughts of God except God the Spirit. And in Hebrews 9, the Spirit is referred to as the eternal Spirit. So, so the Spirit is a person, and the Spirit is divine. That reminds us of Jesus Christ, who is a person, fully God, and fully man. So fully man is a person, fully God, divine. And so we see parallels. We shouldn't be confused about who the Spirit is, just because of the word Spirit and the cultural prevalence of spirituality. So the first prominent work of the Holy Spirit is to be a helper to the Christian. Now that's the translation. Um, Jesus said, speaking to his disciples, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Now there's a little bit of a language barrier to overcome because Jesus didn't say helper. He probably was speaking Aramaic and what's recorded for us is Greek. So the word that was actually used is paraclete. And that's a combination of two words, para, meaning alongside, like a parable, or a parallel, and kaleo, meaning to call, kaleo. So the paraclete, and Jesus said, I will ask the Father and he will give you another paraclete. He's saying he will give you another called alongside one. Well, what does scripture say to indicate what, what a paraclete does? What, is a, what does a paraclete do? Well, Scripture uses the word paraclete five times. Four of them is to refer to the Holy Spirit. I'm pacing. Four of them is to refer to the Holy Spirit. One is used elsewhere, and it refers to Jesus the Christ. Jesus Christ was our first paraclete, called alongside, and he came down from the heavens and lived in our midst alongside us. And he was our first called alongside one to be with us and to do what a paraclete does whilst called alongside. That's why helper is not a bad translation. Through the many translations of the scriptures, which always go back to the Greek, right? It's not translations of translations, but 
dozens of translations of the Greek, people have decided, well, today people are not understanding the words the same, so I'm going to reiterate the scripture in the current language. And, the, and paraclete has been translated helper, it has been translated advocate, it has been, if you read the King James, it's comforter. A paraclete does all of those things. But I want to zone in on the comforter aspect because I think this will help break the language barrier a little more. When the King James Version was written, the English language was a lot closer to its Latin origins. And the word comfort, although when we think of comforter, if you think of the Holy Spirit as a comforter, perhaps that evokes a picture of consolation. That's what the word means today. The Holy Spirit comes as a tender caretaker to bind up our wounds our bruises, and to help us with a peace that surpasses all understanding when the trials and tribulations of the world overcome us. Well, a comforter does that, and the Holy Spirit does that, but the Elizabethan English of the day was a combination of two words, con fortis, which means with strength. So the King James Version is saying that the Holy Spirit is a comforter. It's not saying he's coming to bind up your wounds and console you after the fight. The Spirit is coming with strength to empower you for the fight. What is the fight? The fight is life. Life is tough. The Apostle Paul says in Philippians, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And in Ephesians, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom... Every family in heaven on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with the power, with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And in 1 Timothy, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, an astute listener might say, well, two out of those three times, Mr. Isles, the apostles said Jesus Christ gave him strength. So how can we say that it's the God, the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us when Paul says that it was Christ who strengthens him? Well, the same way that Jesus can say, I am going away. I I alluded to this two weeks ago when I was here. Jesus said, I am going away, and it is to your benefit that I do so, because if I don't go away, I can't send the second Advocate, the second helper, the second paraclete, the Holy Spirit. I am going away so that I can send the Holy Spirit. I will be with you always. I will be with you. I, God, the Holy Spirit, just like Jesus said, I and the Father are one, Jesus can say, I and the Holy Spirit are one. And although I will be with the Father in heaven, I am with you in my spirit. Philip had said, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus replied, Have I been with you so long that you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and that the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Is the same conversation that Jesus says, When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority. Whatever he hears, he will speak. That's exactly what Jesus just said about himself and the Father. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. So all that the Father has is mine. No. And the Spirit will take what is mine and declare it to you. So the Spirit is declaring what the Father says because Jesus didn't say anything that the Father didn't say. And the Holy Spirit doesn't say anything that he doesn't hear from the Father. Philip might as well have said, Jesus, show us the Spirit and it suffices us. And Jesus could have said, have I been with you for so long that you don't know me? I am the Spirit. I and the Spirit are one. 
That's the doctrine of the Trinity at work. What does the Spirit do? The Spirit helps us, comes with strength, empowers us. The Spirit empowered Jesus Christ. Now, when Jesus prayed to God, he was, he was giving us an example. This is how to live. Be like me. Pray to, to, pray to your Father in heaven. And when he was empowered by the Holy Spirit, he said, this is what the Spirit does. Empowers you like it did me. Jesus went and was baptized by John, and that's when he began his ministry. And when he was baptized, you recall that, uh, that the Holy Spirit descended upon him in the bodily form of a dove. And it was at that time that Jesus went back and started preaching in the synagogues. And the scripture says... Blah, 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 blah. Didn't say that. This is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And a report goes out through all of the surrounding country. Jesus had been living... A godly life sinlessly for 30 years and no reports went out about him all throughout all the country until he was baptized by John the Holy Spirit descended upon him in power and Jesus Christ went out and began his ministry in strength and the entire surrounding land heard reports about this because it was amazing it was world-changing and people tried to start, started to try to kill him, of course. Well, how does the Spirit empower us? Well, 1 Corinthians 12 is a good summary. Now, there are a variety of gifts, the Scripture says, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. It is God who empowers the gifts, and what are the gifts? To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same, another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between the Spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to, the, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Wisdom comes from God the Holy Spirit. So that is the first prominent work, is to empower us. The second prominent work is to sanctify the Christian. God's will for our lives is sanctification. Scripture tells us that plainly. When I sin, I incur guilt. I'm not talking about guilt feelings. I'm talking about a debt of guilt before God, a just and holy judge. And I'm exposed to punishment. Justly. Now, when Jesus Christ died for us on the cross, my guilt was taken away. And my punishment was removed. But there's a third thing that happens when I sin, and that is my soul is stained. And what God the Holy Spirit does, the moment that Jesus Christ's sacrifice cleans us of our guilt and of our punishment, the Holy Spirit begins to clean away the stain of sin on the soul and begins to make us more like Christ. That's not instant. That is the work of life. It takes your life, the rest of your life. Why did God choose to make it that way? Why didn't he just say, well, you know what, as soon as you're saved, as soon as you receive Jesus Christ into your heart, I'm going to zot you up into heaven. You're going to be done. I'm going to sanctify you immediately, take away your sin nature. You're... He didn't do that. And I don't know why. But it was his choice to leave us here, to go through life, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and being made holy by the Holy Spirit through the slow process of removing that stain of sin on our souls. And that is why God the Father is holy, God the Son is holy, but we don't say Holy Father, Holy Son like it's part of their name, but we say Holy Spirit because that is the work 
of the Holy Spirit. Just like Jesus the Christ came to atone for our sins, and that was his most prominent work, but God the Holy Spirit, his prominent work is to make us holy. And so the first thing that the Spirit does is empowers us so that we can participate in the second thing that the Spirit does for us to make us holy. We need God's strength to become like God. We can't do that on our own. It's a ridiculous task if left to our own devices. Oh no. All right. So that's my final comment, really. Scripture doesn't tell us why sanctification takes so long, and it doesn't tell us why God's power is made perfect in weakness. But it does tell us, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And also that we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. God is pulling us into his family. He's choosing to sanctify us through empowering us to gain endurance through our trials and tribulations on this world and to gain the experience of loving one another through the rest of our lives. And he even allowed some of us a long period of time without knowing him before he started that process. But none of that was a mistake. Why does he choose to do it that way? God is wiser than I am. I'd like to think I'd do it differently. Well, thank goodness I'm not God and I'm not doing it differently because God is perfect. and His plans are never turned astray. Would you bow your head with me in prayer. Father, we thank you that you have, that you have come down to us in Christ Jesus, your son. We thank you that you have stayed with us forever to the end of the age in your Holy Spirit. And we pray that we recognize the strength that you have imbued in us and we come to you in prayer, in community, to know you and to become familiar with you in our lives. And that rather than you walking with us, that we would walk with you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the United Methodist Church, Our communion table is open to everyone. Please join me for communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. It is, mm, let us give thanks to the Lord our God. And so with the people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in the unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And so,
in the remembrance of these mighty acts. Jesus Christ, we offer these, we offer ourselves the praise of thanksgiving in the, as the holy and living sacrifice in the union of Christ's offering for ourselves and proclaiming the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. All honor and glory is given is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Will you please join me in the Lord's Prayer? Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, as we forgive the sins, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. For taking the communion elements, this is the body of Christ. We're using her. Given for you, the bread of heaven. Take, eat. Take your little wafer. These have all been consecrated. Please eat. This is the blood of Christ who is shed for you. The cup of salvation. Take, drink. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please stand and join me in singing our final song.
Go therefore, because you are children in the triune God and partners in God's work of light, life, and love, that even now is at work all around you, us. May the mystery of the Trinity enfold you, the glory of the Trinity astound you, and the love of the Trinity companion you on your way. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. I pray that you're blessed and protected this week.